Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya, Avira Virma Edhi, Rudra Yate Dakshinamakam, Te Namam Pahinityam, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Lead us from the ever-changing to the unchanging. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through and guide us evermore with thy loving presence. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Good morning. The topic today is glimpses of Swami Saradananda. Uh, can all of you hear me? Can anyone not hear me? Okay. Usually it seems like the volume's a little louder than it is now. So this is part of a series we've been doing on the monastic disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. The aim is to go to original sources as much as possible uh, to try to feel what it was like uh, to be in the immediate presence of these great souls. So far we've done six. This is the seventh direct disciple. So we'll start at the end and then we'll work back there again. We'll start with a retrospective article on Swami Sardananda that appeared in the October 1927 issue of the Prabhuta Bharata uh, two months after his passing. It was written by the editor at the time, Swami Ashokananda. Swami Saradananda, secretary of the Ramakrishna Mott and Mission, passed away at the age of 63 at 2.30 a.m. on Friday the 19th of August. His death has been a profound and irreparable loss to our order and to the innumerable devotees of Sri Ramakrishna. What his death means to the country of India, what a precious asset his life was to the nation, few can possibly yet understand. He lived a life of comparative seclusion, and his activities scarcely appeared in the limelight. But with the growth of the order, and with the acceptance of its principles and methods of work in larger measures by the nation, it will surely, the nation will surely come to feel that Swami Sardananda was, in essence, one of the greatest builders of the Indian nation, at the foundation of which he has been silently and steadily working for the last 30 years. What the Ramakrishna movement is today is largely due to Swami Sardananda. The Ramakrishna mission through its, though it derived its ideals and it derived its inspiration from other sources, owes its present articulate form mainly to the endeavors of the departed Swami. It is he who worked at it from its very inception, giving the ideals concrete form, linking them to the problems of the passing years until it reached its present advanced state of development. The outside world has learnt to praise its philanthropic activity and its dynamic ideals, but it scarcely knew the man who primarily worked at the details of that machinery. And in the meantime, the hearts that received the grace, gracious touch of his love are desolate. The golden chain that linked their worlds to the eternal is broken. And a window of heaven through which streamed the light of God 
into their lives has closed. One of the greatest builders of the Indian nation, Swami Ashokananda says, this is not hyperbole. Swami Vivekananda saw as one of his primary tasks the regeneration of India along spiritual principles. A large part of this is the service of God in suffering humanity. This is not social work, but work is a spiritual discipline that uplifts the person who serves first and enables the person receiving service and, and ennobles the person receiving service as a corollary. Some years ago, there was a devastating earthquake in Gujarat. And I happened to be listening to uh, NPR uh, reporting on the disaster. And the reporter was a roving uh, reporter of natural disasters who'd been all over the world. He'd seen it all. The surprise and admiration in his voice was unmistakable. I'd heard him before in Central America and different places reporting on these natural disasters. He was talking about hundreds of non-governmental organizations flooding into the damaged areas and quietly coordinating among themselves and picking up the pieces. No histrionics, no woe is me, or pulling of one's hair, just getting to work and helping the afflicted. I've reported on disasters all over the world, he said, and I've never seen anything like this. Swami Vivekananda's ideal of service to God in suffering humanity has been accepted in India. It's been assimilated in India. And a large part of that acceptance came from the masterful way that Swami Saradananda set up the human an institutional machinery of the Ramakrishna mission as a service organization for the material and spiritual upliftment of India. Now we'll go through a brief sketch of Swami Saradananda's life, then go to specific details and reminiscences of different parts of it. The Swami came from a rich and orthodox Brahmin family living in Calcutta. His early name, Sarat Chandra Chakravarti. He was born 23rd of December, 1865. From his boyhood, Sarat Chandra was so quiet that people sometimes mistaken it, mistook it for dullness. But when he got to school, he soon showed his extraordinary intelligence. In almost all examinations, he was first. He took delight in many non-academic activities, became a prominent figure in the debating class, and his strong physical physique developed through exercise and attracted notice. His deep religious nature was innate and expressed itself in early boyhood. He would quietly sit next to his mother as she performed worship in the family deity and afterwards faultlessly repeat the ritual before his friends. His play was to do imitation ritual, waiting for the day when he would receive his um, sacred thread and be able to do it himself. This happened at nine and he then performed the ritual in front of the family deity. His nature was courteous. Sarat, as a boy and a young man, was incapable of using a harsh word to anybody or hurting anyone's feelings in any way. He had a very soft and feeling heart and lost no opportunity to help his poor class friends as far as his means permitted. 
The small sum of money that he got as allowance would often be spent for poor boys. Sometimes he would give away his own clothing to those who needed it more. Relatives and friends, acquaintances, neighbors, servants, and housemaids, whoever fell ill, Sarat Chandra was sure to be by their side. And this nursing of whoever needed, whoever needed nursing was a trait that stuck with him to the end of his life. Once a maidservant in a neighbor's house fell ill with cholera. She was taken to a corner of the roof of that house to prevent anyone else from being infected and left there to die. As soon as Sarat Chandra came to know of this, he rushed there and alone did everything necessary for her nursing. The poor woman died in spite of his devoted service. And finding the neighbor indifferent also to her last rites, Sarat made arrangements even for that. This is as a young man while he was still living at home. Tremendous qualities of heart and head innately and very good family, very good family training. As he grew up, even though he was from an orthodox Brahmin family, he came under the influence of the Brahmo leader, Keshab Chandra Sen. He began to study their literature and to practice meditation according to its system. In 1882, he passed the entrance examination to the university and was admitted to St. Xavier's College. The principal of the college, Father Lafrant, being charmed with the deep religious nature of Sarat Chandra, undertook himself to teach him the Bible. Sarat's cousin, Sashi, who was two years older and also became a monastic disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, was living with his family. One of Sashi's friends said that there was a great saint at the temple garden of Dakshineswar. In the course of the subsequent conversation, the three friends decided one day to visit the saint. It was October 1883. Sarat was 18. Rama, Ram, Sri Ramakrishna received them very cordially. He asked them to take down one of the books from the shelf and read an extract from the Bible, setting forth Christ's opinion on marriage. He could see with Sarat and Sashi what they were meant for, what their lives were meant for. So he was starting off in this way. Not necessarily their friend, but these two. The passage is this. There are some eunuchs who were born so, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. He that is able to receive, let him receive. Do you mean to say, sir, one of them said, that marriage is against the will of God? And how can God keep his creation going if people don't marry? The master smiled and said, you don't have to worry about that. Those who like to marry are perfectly at liberty to do so. What I said just now was between these boys and I. I say what I have to say. You may take as much or as little as you like. That, that's like a tadpole, he said. You, I, I, I'll give you the whole tadpole. You cut off the head and tail, do whatever you like. He told Sarat and Sashi and others that he had seen in ecstasy that they had been followers of Jesus Christ during Christ's lifetime, and we'll get back to that. In terms of his orientation toward spiritual life, Sri Ramakrishna was in a mood to give people different spiritual experiences. 
and did so with people that were there, close devotees, some of whom became monastics. On this occasion, the master said to Sharat, how would you like to realize God? What divine visions do you prefer to see in meditation? Sarat said, Sir, I do not want to see any particular form of God in meditation. I want to see him as manifested through all creatures of the world. I do not like visions. The master said with a smile, but that is the last word in spiritual attainment. You cannot have it all at once. Sir, I will not be satisfied with anything short of that. I shall trudge on in the path of religious practice until that blessed day arrives. What grit and what clarity of vision he had. Sri Ramakrishna in one of the accounts said, yes, you will attain it. A few months after this, Sri Ramakrishna was praising a young man named Narendranath, speaking so highly of him that Sharat felt tempted to have personal acquaintance with such a person and got his address from the master. On meeting Narendranath, he found that he was none other than the young man whom once he had met at the house of his friend and mistakenly uh, uh, taken for a very misguided, conceited, arrogant, and rude young man. <laughs> so much is ordinary assessment compared with the masters. This time it was different. That acquaintance ripened soon into a close friendship. So great was their attachment to one another that sometimes Sharat and Narendra could be found in the streets of Calcutta deeply engaged in conversation till one in the morning, walking the distance between their homes many times, one intending to the, escort the other to the latter's home. But finding the conversation wasn't done, they'd walk back to the other home. And finding it wasn't done, they'd keep walking back and forth. Sharat afterwards used to say, however freely Swami Vivekananda, that is Narendranath at the time, mixed with us, at this very first meeting, I saw here was one who belonged to a class by himself. So he was his friend, but he also immediately respected him as someone that was from a different plane. Sri Ramakrishna was glad beyond measure when he learned that Sarat Chandra had not only met Narendranath, but that a deep love had sprung up between the two. He remarked in his characteristic, homely way, the mistress of the house knows which lid will go with which pot. Sarat Chandra was drawn into Sri Ramakrishna's monastic fold. He quit medical school to join the young men who served Sri Ramakrishna when he developed throat cancer. He took monastic vows in January of 1887 with the others and given the name Swami Saradananda by Narendranath. And as I said, he came from a wealthy family as did Swami Trikuna Tidananda. And their parents, particularly their fathers, gave them probably the hardest time of all the monastic disciples. Um, his father's name was Girish, and Girish uh, initially, before things got too serious, thought that all this was nonsense and this unlettered Brahmin was not suitable for his educated and gentlemanly son. And he took his very distinguished family guru, who was a pundit and um, a very sincere and adept spiritual aspirant, uh, <clears throat> to meet Sri Ramakrishna while his son was there. And the intent was uh, his son could see the two of them conversing and realize, of course, 
The family guru was so much better. What happened was just the opposite. Just a bit of conversation, and the family guru whispered to Sarat's father, to have a guru like this, your son is truly blessed. But that didn't solve the problem. When it looked like uh, Sarat was going to renounce the world, and he started living at Kasipur Garden. Uh, no, after the master's death, uh, Sarat started to go to the Baranagar Monastery, and his dad managed to lock him up in the house somewhere to keep him from this dastardly way of life. <laughs> and um, Sarat's younger brother secretly went and unlocked the door, and that was the last of it. He went to the monastery, didn't come back. From 1887, the year after Sri Ramakrishna's passing, to 1895, Sarananda traveled to holy places in northern and western India as an itinerant monk, practicing hard spiritual discipline, sometimes alone, sometimes with other disciples, monastic and lay of the, of the master. In the meantime, Vivekananda started his work in the West in 1893. And by 1895, he wrote to Saradananda, come to England, and then he came to America to help with the work. Swami Saradananda took Holy Mother's counsel before leaving India. She said, my child, don't be afraid. You should go to the West. Sri Ramakrishna will protect you and be with you wherever you go. He worked mostly in um, New York, the New York area and New England, uh, in and around Boston. Um, and one incident uh, bears uh, mentioning. Um, he used to hold uh, classes regularly in Montclair, uh, New Jersey, uh, in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Wheeler. And uh, they were a couple with, with children. It was a very exemplary American home where the children were raised with much love and freedom. It was a happy home. And he just didn't go there for classes. He'd stay there for a few days and give several classes and then go off to go back to New York. So this is uh, narrated by Swami Atulananda. An interesting incident, and it was, it was the home of Mr. and Mrs. Wheeler. An interesting incident took place when Sardananda was living in this happy home. The Swami had often spoken of Sri Ramakrishna, and one day he produced his master's photograph and showed it to the lady of the house. Mrs. Wheeler said, Oh, Swami, it's the same face. What do you mean, the same face? And she narrated, Long ago in her youth, before she was married, she was very sick. This is when she was a late teenager, living at home. And her life was kind of hanging in the balance. And during this critical period, she saw someone who was obviously a Hindu in a vision. And from that time, she started to recover. So it wasn't just a vision. It was important for both her spiritual health and her, for her physical health and recovery and her spiritual inspiration. She told them that long ago in her youth, she, before being married, she had had a vision of a Hindu and that it was the same face that she now saw. It was Sri Ramakrishna, she said, but I did not know it until now. I was so much impressed and charmed at the vision at the time that I remember the face very clearly and I have been going about here and there ever since I had the vision wherever I heard that a Hindu had come to America. But I, but I was always disappointed not finding the same face. And at last, now, I see that it was your master, Sri Ramakrishna. Later, referring to this incident, Swami Saradananda said, the master chooses his own men and women. 
We are mere instruments in his hands. It is a privilege to work under his banner. In America, Sri Ramakrishna had already prepared the ground for me. I was not alone. He brought to me men and women of exalted character who helped me in our work and who bore great love for our master. After about two years in America and England, Vivekananda asked Swami Saradananda to come back to India to help him organize the Ramakrishna Mat and mission. Swami Brahmananda was made the spiritual head and Swami Saradananda the chief executive of the organization. Swami Saradananda served in that capacity from 1898 until his death in 1927. When Swami Brahmananda passed away, uh, they had an election to see who would be the succeeding president. Swami Saradananda got 95% of the votes and declined. He said, I'll stay where Swami Vivekananda put me till the last. Swami Shivananda became president. So during these formative years, when the, the, the whole thing was taking shape uh, in Swami Vivekananda's mind, and he was articulating this to his brother disciples, sometimes with opposition, um, he one day sent Saradananda to Calcutta on an errand. When he learned the errand had not been done, he, he just laid Saradananda out. Swami Vivekananda was an expert at cursing. He could make up curse words that would make you blush and, and make you so uh, riled up, you know, that uh, sometimes Swami Brahmananda would start crying when he was scolded like this. Swami Vivekananda knew he didn't have much time left and he knew the importance of the work, so he had to use whatever means were necessary. <laughs> he was very creative with his scoldings. Saradananda remained motionless like a statue. When tea was served subsequently, he started to drink it as if nothing had happened. Disappointed, Swami Vivekananda commented, Sharat's veins carry the blood of a fish. It will never warm up. Observing that Saradananda was free from anger, Vivekananda teased him at other times, saying, your veins carry frog's blood, or the blood of a sandfish. Swamiji <laughs> actually appreciated this. He knew that this noble emid mindedness, a, a sign of steady wisdom, is necessary for the executive head of such an organization. After Vivekananda died in 1902, the responsibilities of the order fell on Saradananda, but he always consulted with Brahmananda, the president, when making any decision on serious matters. And he also became the caretaker of Holy Mother and built a house for her in Calcutta, the Udbodhan house. He also became editor of Udbodhan. He had so much responsibility. In the early days with Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna once sat on his lap and said, I'm just seeing how much weight you can bear. Swami Seshananda, who later became his private secretary and personal attendant, hypothesized. He not only sat on his lap to see how much weight he could bear, he also blessed him, uh, giving him the strength to bear it. From 1909 to 1919, Swami Saradana Ronda Sarmi Sardananda wrote the spiritual biography of Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Sri Ramakrishna Lila Prasanga. Which is a masterpiece of mystical literature. When we sent Swami Chaitananda's, in, in a very unusual book in its scope and what it covers, when we sent Swami Chaitananda's English translation to 
the Library of Congress for cataloging before publication, it got held up because they didn't know which category to put it in. <laughs> it was a problem. So he started writing this biography for several reasons. Uh, partly to pay for the debt he incurred to build Holy Mother's house in Calcutta, and partly to give accurate, detailed, in-depth understanding of Sri Ramakrishna. A lot of misinformation was coming out about Sri Ramakrishna at the time. And he knew it because he was editing the Udbodhan magazine. He'd have to correct it before those articles were published. He was asked by one of his attendants, Swami Asidananda, in later life, if he had experienced Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Swami Saradananda said, read the chapter in Leela Prasanga on Samadhi. I have not written anything about Samadhi without experiencing it myself. Remember Swami Saradananda's early wish. He wanted to see God manifest in all beings. This is Vigyana. Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the world is, disappears, and only that reality remains. But beyond that, those that come back from that exalted experience seek God in and through every being. We'll go to Sister Devamata for this period of life, of his life. Um, Sister Deva Mata was intimately associated with the work in America from 1895 till the end of her life. And uh, th this reminiscence, in 1895, she heard Swami Vivekananda speak in New York City. and um, In various ways, she was connected with the work after that. Uh, she went to India in, um, when was it? 1908 early and left in late uh, 1909. And um, mostly it was in South India with Swami Ramakrishnananda. Uh, but the last three months was spent in Calcutta uh, for the purpose of being in the blessed company of the Holy Mother, Sri Sarada Devi. And it was during this time that she came to know Sarat Maharaj, Swami Saradananda. Uh, and this is her reminiscence in the 1932 uh, Prabhu Bharata. It was not my good fortune to meet Swami Saradananda during the two years of his stay in America. I was studying at the Sorbonne in Paris, so missed him. But I returned to New York in time to catch the afterglow of his lingering presence. Everyone spoke of him with a tenderness of feeling that told of the great love he had awakened in their hearts. I came in contact with him in Calcutta. I saw at once why he had called forth so much love wherever he went in the West. He seemed to possess an exalted gentleness, a graciousness and courtesy which made direct appeal. He was of the highest breeding, the breeding not merely of manner and culture, but of spirit. It was the outgrowth of divine rather than human relations. It was at Calcutta chiefly that Swami Saradananda passed his days. A room was kept for him at the Bellarmat on the Ganges above the city, but he occupied it infrequently. His life was lived in a little room across the hall from the Udbodhan office. The Udbodhan is the official Bengali monthly of the Ramakrishna mission. In the far inner quarter of this room, beside a long open window opening to a central courtyard, the Swami sat cross-legged at a small writing table in front of him. Hour after hour he wrote articles for the magazine. A book of his, that was, a, a book of his own was his biography of Ramakrishna, about a thousand pages, official letters or letters to friends. Visitors came and he would lay down his pen or pencil only to pick it up again as soon as they were gone. When daylight dimmed and the lamps were brought, a little desk was pushed aside and pen and pencil and thought grew still. 
The room was always full at this hour, and one of his younger men would read aloud from a holy book. As the reading progressed, a choir of sounds mingled with the voice. The trickling water in the courtyard, the low, row, low rumble of a passing cart or carriage, the distant ringing of a vesper bell, the murmur of a chant from the room above where Sri Sarada Devi had her quarters. But Swami Saradananda heard only the voice telling of divine things. The even course of Swami's day was broken by two habitual interruptions. The first was his noon visit to Girish Chandra Ghosh, the famous dramatist. If I remember correctly, he took his noon meal there. It was as each day I watched him walk along the lane and turn the corner toward Girisha's house that I realized how kingly was his bearing. With all his gentleness, there was something royal in his step. There was something royal in the way he held himself. Both revealed a nobility of spirit which bore witness to the fineness of his early training and the opening openness of his heart to his master's influence. Though very different, he and Girish Babu were warm friends. They had many points of contact, the foremost, their ardent devotion to Sri Ramakrishna. Another was a keen literary, literary interest. The Swami was not was not the unique and towering genius of Girish Babu, but he possessed a distinct literary gift. And Girish had encouraged him to write about the master. He knew that the depth of understanding that was required for subsequent generations would not be met if those who knew him did not write his biography. And Sarat felt that in later life, it was not he who wrote it. He couldn't write the end of it. He says, I can't write it. The master's not inspiring me. And when I look at what I wrote, I think, did I, did I write that? You see? But this was partly so that he could share what he was doing with Girish, who was uh, uh, such a... Uh, an acutely accomplished literary figure, and so that he didn't make any unwit unwitting mistakes. Um, he wasn't worried about the spiritual part of it, but he was worried about uh, the, the other things which make the entire package uh, understandable and, and palatable. The second break in the day's routine was the afternoon conference with with Yogan Ma. Yogan Ma was one of uh, the two ladies that really spent their lives with Holy Mother and, and looked after her. It was at this time that he acquainted himself with Holy Mother's wishes and needs. He was her staunch devotee and had the special privilege of looking after her. He it was who accompanied her on her journey to and from her village, and it was he who saw that she provided was provided with everything she required. He didn't mount the stairs often to talk with her. His deep reverence and devotion for her seemed to keep him from intruding on the sanctity of her life in those upper rooms, set apart from the world. But he sought eagerly every opportunity to hear of her her from others. Often he would stop me in the evening as I passed from the court to the entrance door and ask me what Holy Mother had said and done through the day. Keep in mind he's also the executive head of this organization, taking care of problems with the monastics, the, the disaster relief work, whatever was going on. I saw Swami Saradananda in Calcutta more frequently than any of the other direct disciples of Ramakrishna. 
In the morning, when I came from Nivedita school where I slept, to Holy Mother's quarters where I spent the day, he would come out from his little room beside the entrance and speak with me. Again at noon, usually we had a few words, and always at night a few more. Occasionally longer conversations. One morning, instead of coming out the door to greet me, he asked me to come in his office. There was an air of distress about him which troubled me. His first words deepened that impression. Sister, you will not mind if I tell you something. He repeated the question several times before he explained. The previous day, Radu, Holy Mother's niece, had spilled a, a, a glass of water on her noon meal, and unthinkingly I had wiped it up. He said, you know, we have very unusual customs here. She's from the village, and this actually might have a negative effect on her marriage potential. Fortunately, it didn't. But what she took away from this, the chief value of the incident lay in what it showed me about how reluctant the Swami was to speak the least word that might wound or offend. This quality is talked about by Swami Saradananda. And I'm sorry, it is talked about by Swami Gambirananda, who knew Swami Saradananda. He joined uh, the order in the early 20s and later became president himself. We find Swami Saradananda mainly in two roles, secretary, executive head of the Ramakrishna Krishnamath and mission, and as a spiritual personality. As the secretary, as the executive head, he was so much in the love and esteem of the monastic and lay workers that his slightest desire was fulfilled with utmost veneration. And this love and esteem was the effect of the Swami's extreme solicitude for their welfare and his unreserved confidence in them and in their spiritual potential. It was very difficult to prejudice him against anybody and his confidence and trust were never betrayed. He was democratic in attitude and always kept an open mind. Even to the words of a boy, he would listen with great attention and patience. When he found he committed a mistake at any time, he would not hesitate to acknowledge it immediately. Once he took a young man to task for a supposed fault, afterwards he came to find out that the young man was not at fault. And he immediately apologized. Now for someone in this position uh, at that time in India, this was extremely unusual, but he couldn't rest until he had find, found the young man and apologized. Though wielding so much power, he had not the slightest love of power in him. Humility itself. He felt that anyone might know better than he, and he listened. His idea was that everyone was striving after ultimate freedom knowingly or unknowingly, striving after liberation. And that that hankering expressed itself in the love of freedom in our ordinary actions. So the Swami would not willingly disturb anyone's freedom. I want to talk a little bit about his relationship with Holy Mother. We've touched on it through Sister Devamata's um, reminiscences. Seated in a small room downstairs at Udboden House, he regulated Holy Mother's visitors, some of whom were pretty crazy. Sometimes he jestingly introduced himself to strangers as Holy Mother's doorman. Assuming the responsibility for her care involved not only looking after mother, but her family, four or five monastic members when she was at Jairambadi, and, his three, and her three nieces who were eccentric and infirm. As an example, 
Radu, her niece, and her protracted illness had cost the mother heavily, draining her slender and unstable income. Although the devotees at this time were ardent, they weren't rich, they were middle class, and there wasn't that much money available. Swami Saradananda, seeing the situation, wrote to America, to uh, Sarah Bull, who he'd worked with closely in Boston and Cambridge. And from that time, Sarah Bull sent 250 rupees a month to Holy Mother for her expenses. Once Holy Mother told her attendant, Swami Arupananda, I will be able to be at this Udvodan house as long as Sharat, she never called him by his monastic name, as long as Sharat is here. I don't see anyone who can be responsible for me after that. Sharat can carry my burden in every respect. Swami Arupananda asked if Swami Brahmananda could look after her. No, my child. That is not his temperament. He is cast differently. It is difficult for him to bring his mind down to meet situations of a complicated nature. His mind naturally soars so high. He can look after me mentally from a distance or attend to my needs through someone else. Well, what about Swami Premananda? No, he can't either. But he's running Belarmat. That may be my child. But looking after women is something else again. He can keep an eye on me from a distance. Swami Saradananda, at one point, took uh, instruction under his uncle, Sashi's father, uh, who was a tantric adept, uh, with the desire to follow that uh, spiritual tradition until he realized the presence of the Divine Mother in all women, and that was accomplished. So he had that ability to be with Mother's difficult family and all those difficult situations and not be perturbed. Mother called Swami Saradananda her Vasuki, the mythical snake who protected her with a thousand hoods. If anyone tried to persuade Holy Mother to go to Calcutta when the Swami was not there, she would say, there can be no question of my going there while Sarat is gone. To whom shall I go? Suppose I'm in Calcutta and Sarat says that he wants to go elsewhere for a few days. I tell him, Wait a bit, my child. First of all, let me leave, and then you may go. In her last days, Holy Mother was heard to remark, I'm, I am tired of this life. I shall now leave. Taking Sharat in my arms and carrying them, him wherever I go. When he heard this, Swami Saradananda wept like a child. In 1919, he wrote a long letter to the mother describing the suffering of people throughout India from terrible famine and the influenza epidemic. He asked for her blessings and prayed that the mission would get the necessary funds from the public for the needed relief activities. She burst into tears when an attendant read the letter. With a choked voice, she said, I cannot bear this suffering of people. O oh Lord, may you be pleased to do something. Be kind enough to put an end to their sorrow and pain. Then she looked at the devotees seated around and said, do you see the heart of Sharat? You will not find another person with so big a heart as his, except Narendranath. 
There may be illumined souls, knowers of Brahman, but you will not find another man in India or elsewhere so kind, so compassionate, so generous, as you see in the personality of Sharat. His heart cries for suffering humanity. He is like the great protector, protecting people with food, shelter, and clothing, whatever may be their needs. None can be compared to him. As his heart is big, so is his love is vast and all-embracing. Speaking of Sarat, she said, she held him out as an example for his lay devotees, saying, you look at your burden, look at Sarat's burden, see how he bears it, unmoving, like the blacksmith's handle, all these blows come, he doesn't react, he takes care of it. Not whispering a word of complaint, he's, his mouth is shut, he's truly a holy man. Why should Sharat bother about all these things, all these mundane uh, doings? Men like him, if they wish, can easily sit quietly and concentrate on God, devoting their time to meditation for hours and hours together. Why do they not do that? It is only for your good that they bring their minds to a lower plane and engage themselves in all kinds of activity for the sake of suffering humanity. For his part, Saradananda implicitly obeyed every one of the mother's instructions and carried out her wishes unquestioningly, with one exception. <clears throat> In 1920, mother was stricken with Kalazar a dangerous, painful, fever-ridden disease. <coughs> Excuse me. Her doctors prescribed a bitter Western medicine to be taken several times a day in a bland diet consisting mainly of barley water and milk. She followed the regime without complaint for a long time, but finally it caused her to lose her appetite and her temper. She said to her attendant, Sarala Devi, You know only two things. Bring the thermometer and see the temperature and bring barley water and milk, coaxing me to drink more and more. I am tired of all this. She asked Anise to bring some good food, puffed rice and food fried in mustard oil, which village people were very fond of, but which happens to be harmful to the disease she had. When the food was brought to her, she gave first some to her niece and put the rest in a cup for herself. As she was about <laughs> to take the food, fried in mustard oil, Swami Sardananda entered the room. One of her attendants had run to him for help, and as he climbed the stairs, Swami Sardananda wondered how in the world was he going to say no to Holy Mother. And yet his sense of responsibility for her well-being compelled him to do just that. Seeing him, Holy Mother hid the cup behind her back and said, My child, why have you come? What can I do for you? The Swami who had entered her presence with folded hands knelt before her saying, Mother, I have come for a purpose, and I beg you to fulfill it. I request you to give me the cup that you're hiding behind your back. All of your children downstairs, including me, will eat its contents joyfully, and we will fill it for you again when you are well. At first, mother, like a village girl, holding on to her favorite thing, didn't want to give it up, but finally she did, with the knowledge that Swami Sardananda was asking for it, only to serve her. 
So what about the young monks that were in Swami Saradananda's care? And this would include the whole order. But for this, I'll go to Swami Asayshananda, who was with him, uh, as I said, from 1921 as, uh, to 27 as his personal attendant and private secretary. It was 1917. I was a student at St. Paul's Christian College in Calcutta with no thought whatsoever of becoming a monk. But I had heard of Sri Sarada Devi, the widow of Sri Ramakrishna, and I'd heard she was a great holy woman in her own right. So I was interested when my friends brought me the news that she was now in Calcutta, coming from her village home in Jarambati. On impulse, I went to the Udbodhan where she was staying with some of my friends on a, day when, on a day when male devotees could pay their respects and receive her blessings. Now he actually became Holy Mother's disciple. After a wait, a monk told us we could go upstairs to see Mother. We prostrated before her and touched her feet. Then we came downstairs and started talking with Swami Thirananda, a senior monk. While we were speaking, I heard a voice call out from the next room. Let the boy that has left his shoes on the threshold come here. I was that boy. I rose and followed the voice through the doorway. There, dominating the room, was the large imposing figure of Swami Saradananda. Do these shoes belong to you? Yes, Maharaj. Why have you left them on the threshold? You should have put them where they belong, under the staircase. Keep, keeping them on the doorstep causes inconvenience to others. You should be more careful. These stern words given the force by the Swami's somber appearance cut me deeply. Out of fear, I avoided him for the next four years. <laughs> <laughs> Staying away from Udboden House unless Holy Mother was there. Instead, I went to see Swami Brahmananda in the nearby host house of Balaram Bhosh. Swami Sardananda was methodical about everything. He could not bear a casual, haphazard way of doing things. He, in turn, had learned this quality from his master, Sri Ramakrishna. I believe that Swami Sardananda had used harsh treatment to impress me with the need for responsibility. He was the embodiment of responsibility and the precision that brings orderliness to the inner life as well as the outer. I believe he saw my future and knew that I would have to be responsible for a large spiritual family and alert for the welfare of others. Holy Mother's departure from Calcutta put me in a quandary. Without her holy presence, my fear of Swami Saradananda prevented me from visiting Udbodhan and receiving the benefit of those that lived there. I turned to Holy Mother, praying silently, O oh Mother, your name is Abhaya, the bestower of fearlessness. Please, please remove this fear which is troubling me so much. Like most prayers, its fulfillment took time and came in increments. In 1921, I joined the Ramakrishna order. Then destiny in the form of malaria sent me back to the Udbodhan to act as an assistant to the office manager. And once I was there, I began hearing stories of Swami Saradananda's compassionate heart from those who worked under his direction. But still, I felt uneasy, and even though staying there, went out of my way to avoid him. One day, the Swami called me to his upstairs room. His stern look was gone. Sweetly, he asked, would you be able to write letters for me? I will dictate and you will write. I will sign after reading what you have written. 
but you must not divulge the content of the letters to anyone, not even your best friend. My fear vanished. That was the beginning of my association with Swami Saradananda as his private secretary and personal attendant. As I write, my mind goes, but this, he published this book in 1982. As I write, my mind goes back to the years, 1921 to 27, when I lived with the Swami in Calcutta. In memory, I see him enter the shrine of the Udboden House. I see him prostrate in front of the portrait of Holy Mother before returning to his room to become absorbed in meditation. Once again, I hear his voice as he dictates to me. Once again, I watch him sign the completed letter in his careful hand. I relive the time when in replying to a request for spiritual instruction, the Swami had me write. I dictate this letter to a person who will never divulge its contents, even at the cost of his own life. Even now, that memory sends a thrill through my body. I came to love and respect him. In him, I found all that was great and true. He was a living exemplar of the teachings of Vedanta. As I said, Swami Seshananda was a disciple of... Um, the Holy Mother, and he saw Swami Saradananda, and she gave initiation in a very simple, uncomplicated way. And he saw Swami Saradananda uh, did so very elaborately, um, and uh, give very detailed instructions and so on and so forth. And one day he asked Swami Saradananda, he said, you know, Mother didn't tell me much. Could you give me some more instructions uh, about um, related to initiation. I see that you do that with your disciples. And Swami Saradananda turned on him, he said, you are the greatest fool. <laughs> Holy Mother is the last word. Just do what she told you to do. Everything's taken care of. I have to do that because I'm not nearly at her level. So, uh, we're, we've worked our way back to the end of the story, and we'll talk now about um, his passing. On the 6th of January, 1927, Sardananda followed his regular routine, taking his morning bath, meditating for three hours in his room, going to the shrine to prostate, prostrate to bow down before the pictures of the Holy Mother and Ramakrishna. His life was regulated like clockwork. And, but on that day, instead of just leaving, he stayed in the shrine for half an hour. Then he came to the exit door and again returned to the shrine. He repeated this unusual behavior a few times. Standing in front of Holy Mother's picture, he silently prayed. When he finally came out, Sardananda's face was glowing with joy and serenity. As I mentioned before, during her last illness, Holy Mother remarked, I'm tired of this life, and I shall now leave with Sarat in my arms and take him wherever I go. Swami Asesananda narrates, I went to the Swami's room in the late afternoon, and he dictated letters for an hour and a half. The bell for Vespers rang, and I was about to go to the shrine to join my brother monks. When the Swami asked me, wait, let's finish all the letters before you leave. He read each letter carefully and signed them all. I then took the letters and mailed them. After the Vesters, Vespers, Swami Hari Premananda and I went to the Swami's room. We found him half reclining on his bed, struggling to get up, unable to do so. He said, don't tell anybody. Make no noise. I will go downstairs to meet the devotees 
very soon. Vaikunthanath Sanyal, who had come into the room, asked me to call Dr. Ghosh. And when the doctor arrived, he told us to put an ice bag on the Swami's head and change it every five minutes. I went by streetcar to get new ice bags, but by the time I had returned, the house was crowded with monks from Bellarmat who had come to render service to their beloved Swami. We learned he'd had suffered a cerebral stroke and there had been damage to his brain. He retained consciousness, but his speech was impaired. A few days later, the Swami could only smile in response to the doctor's question, Sharat, do you want to drink tea? Another day, he had to use his left hand to drink holy water from a spoon. Every system of medication was tried, Western, homeopathic, Ayurvedic, in vain. Even in this condition, without speech, the Swami continued to transform the lives of those who came to see him. When the homeopathic doctor came to treat the Swami for the first time, the Swami looked at him, and the doctor's agnosticism disappeared. He became an ardent devotee of Sri Ramakrishna. It was the day of Sri Krishna's birth anniversary, the 19th of August, 1927. His condition was rapidly deteriorating. All hope was gone. About 1 p.m. we began to chant, Hari Om Ramakrishna. And in the midst of our chanting, the Swami drew his last breath. We chanted, Purnamada, Purnamida, Purnat, Purnat Mudachade, Purnaisya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vashishade, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. That invisible is infinite, this visible is also infinite. This infinite has been projected from that infinite. When this visible infinite merges into that infinite, all that remains is also infinite. Om, peace, peace.